So hello, my name is Mateusz Kubyszak. I'm a simple programmer um, with some, you know, by, by basically algorithmic background. Um, I do a little bit of contribution to open source. I write up my blog, blog and that is enough about me because we met here today to talk a little bit about Richard Feynman and how he explained math and how we can learn from him when it comes to explaining functional, functional programming. So, who was Richard Feynman? As you can see with the, in this picture, he was um, probably quite interesting guy. He, he was playing in bongos. Uh, he was known because he was playing bongos on, on a lot of, of his like lectures to show some principles of sound to students and basically to show them that teaching don't have to be like you know very stiff and boring. He was also one of the scientists who worked at Los Alamos and Manhattan Project, so he was co-creator of the nuclear weapon. Well, quite an achievement. Another thing he did, he was discoverer of the Feynman diagrams, for which he received the Nobel Prize in physics. And he was also one of the investigators of the, the Challenger disaster when the, basically the Challenger spaceship uh, exploded. So he was one of the investigators who figured out the cause after the catastrophe. Uh, he was also the, he also did a lot of teaching. There are some f famous famous lecturers which are very good interaction to physics. He was reviewer of some students' books for that time, and he also wrote two books about himself when he talks about his approach to life, to science, to everything. One of them, uh, sure you're joking, Mr. Feynman is a great book, and I just have to recommend everyone to read it because it's. Real, real nice. So, to contrast this uh, funny-looking picture of Fema playing a bongos, so we'll, we'll, you know, he was also a very curious guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, some more serious pictures. First one is the nuclear explosion that he co-created. The other is the Feynman diagram. So probably some of you already saw them. So, yeah, this is the guy that came up with them. And the final image is the well, challenger catastrophe that he help to investigate. So when it comes to the Feynman diagrams, there's an interesting story how he basically came up with the idea. So after the work at the Los Alamos, he felt burned out. He felt that there was a lot of expectation of him when he worked at Cornell, that he as a lecturer who worked on the Manhattan Project has to came up with something astonishing, amazing, and a lot of words that he would feel very burdened with all of expectations. Um, and then one of his co-workers, Bob Wilson, chief of laboratory, approached him and said, you know, Feynman, you are doing quite a good job when it comes to teaching students. You like it, you love it, so just focus on that. And when it comes to all the scientific works, the risk was on us when we hired you, so just, you know, chill out and be cool. So we decided to give it a shot. So if they don't want to fire him for not producing new music paper every few weeks, so he decided to play a little bit with physics, chill out. And at what time he was at the cafeteria, and he saw that someone, some guy was like throwing up some plates. So he noticed that this plate was, first of all, rotating, and the other thing, it was wobbling. And he noticed that there is a, was a, some particular think about how the speed of rotating compared to the speed of wobbling, he decided, okay, maybe if I try to figure out if there is some mathematical relation when it comes to speed of rotating to the speed of wobbling, um, just for the sake of it, no particular reason, because, you know, they won't, they won't fire me, I can do whatever I want, so he decided to write it, write it, he started solving this equation, and he arrived that the the conclusion that the difference between the speeds it was exactly one to two. Later on, people checked, checked out his claim and figured out that he was, you know, a little bit mistaken. It was exactly the opposite, but basically it, the principle that there's some very specific ratio between them was held. And he thought that, well, this was quite an astonishing, astonishing result. He started to talk to people, hey, people, guys, if you have this plate and he's like wobbling and rotating, the ratio of speeds is always exactly that. And, uh, yeah, but what's the practical side of it? 
There is no practical side of it, but it's quite fun, don't you think? And this way he basically recovered from the bar note because he rediscovered his love for the science and calculating things just for the fun of it and enjoyment and satisfaction not to produce some results. And after a while he was starting to figure, okay, th those are plates, but if those were electrons and if we applied some direct equation and quantum electrodynamics, and after a while he arrived at those basically fam Feynman diagrams. So as he stated, his Nobel Prize achievement that moved around the physics pushed it forward. It all came from the fact that he recovered from burnout by finding out his love to the subject. Um, so by basically rediscovering uh, fun about the mathematics. There are other anecdotes like that about other mathematicians. For instance, Stanislav Ulam, the inventor of the Monte Carlo methods. He actually didn't want to invent any sort of like super algorithm. What he wanted to do was checking out if he could always uh, win a solitaire game. So he tried, okay, what is the probability that the set of cards is impossible to like, impossible to win the game? So he tried to do it like, you know, very methodically. Figure out if you can determine in a deterministic way, check if you always complete these cards. But he thought, okay, it's too complex, so try something else. But what if we like use the random approach, like shuffle the cards, check is it possible to uh, win the soldier? Yes, no, okay. Let's try to do this 10,000 times and then check how many times we succeeded. And okay, so the probability is pretty close to what is happening in the real world. So yeah, uh, it's quite a useful metal. Then he told about it to von Neumann, also one of those other scientists working on the Manhattan Project. And von Neumann said, hey, you know, we can use it for simulating atoms and collisions, and it would move on when it comes to our like, research. So this way, one of those very important metals was discovered basically by um, fun and financial also satisfaction about our work. So. Um, that was, you know, very interesting thing when you would, like look at a lot of those discoveries. They were a result of some simple fun. So it could be a lesson for us that when you want to learn something or study something or basically discover something new, if we were you know, like really stiff around things, probably we won't succeed and it will be difficult. And well, there have to be like some fun and satisfaction in our work if we want to succeed. So. Um, when you look at uh, Feynman, then you can see that he was like taking a part in the dancing competition, on, and he was also drawing um, well ladies. His second wife didn't have any, uh, any thing against him going to the nightclubs when he was like solving mathematical equations and drawing ladies on the napkins. So, you know, um, interesting guy. Definitely, you can. Can call him like you know the, all those boring old men doing science and stuff. So, yeah, pretty cheerful guy. Um, uh, there's also the, when com when it also comes to these things about you know fun and science and learning. Uh, there was a great talk by John Cleese about creativity when he said that if you want to like unlock the creativity, you have to get a little bit into a play zone because when you are in this, this systematic zone, you can be creative. And same thing is when it comes to like um, learning. So when you want to show so something to someone and you want them to like, and basically get something out of this learning, remember stuff. So you have to make it a little bit fun because it's like boring exercise. You can only make them memorize stuff and then they will forget it in you know, quite a while. But if they enjoy them, it's gonna stay with them like forever. So um, we should try to do, do something like that. Um, the other thing that Sir that famous doing it was reviewing the students' books. It was I think for preschool, uh, and there was the story that he told in his book. Basically, when he got the books about like you know nature, physics, and stuff, he read just something like, okay, children, so we have a question. How does it happen that plants grow, that um, 
airplane works, and let cars drive. And here, okay, well, it's a pretty good question when it comes to talking about natural process. Plants take the photons that came from the sun, they turn it in the, inside the chloroform into those chemical reactions, and with, with, those energy, with those chemical reactions, they can like release the um, electrons that moves on the process inside the uh, plant, and you can see that this uh, high-speed particles coming from the sun like power up the plants, similar with uh, planes or cars, that there you have like those uh, fuels that burn. By burning, they like decompress air. This decompressing air or whatever is moving some mechanical parts. Those mechanical parts uh, turns the engine and things work. So, yeah, a lot of great, great opening to talking about natural processes. But then the student books goes something in a different direction. It goes. Um, so the answer to all of this question is energy. So. Philemon was like, it's not a real question, it's not a real answer. It's basically avoiding the answer, it's just telling you, okay, we have a problem, so how we solve it? Let's use a magic word that is an answer to everything. So he thinks, no, it's not a good way of explaining things. Here we have like, you know, several types of energy, a lot of stuff, I've taken that from Wikipedia, and does it actually explain anything to you? I don't think so, energy is some abstraction. That helps us describe process. It works out well, very well mathematically. We can like compare stuff, but it's not something you start with. It's something you arrive at after you like did a lot of research as figure out that there are some relationships inside nature. So, if it's a, uh, like a conclusion after you study some process, then you can use it as a some sort of description that helps you compare some processes and how they happen and what is the relationship between them. But you can start with that, with, with you know, like abstract word. This abstract word are like utility. They are not explanation on your own. So um, also there are some, like stories about him like that goes like okay. So if you cannot explain something to a student or to a child without using math, then do you, you don't understand it. This quote is actually attributed not only to him, but also to several other people. But there's also another story where someone asked Feynman, okay, Feynman, do you understand this and this? Let me, let me think, think about it. He came up back the next day, okay, uh, if I were to explain to a child, I would say this and this and this and that. So yeah, yeah, I think I understand. And how would you explain quantum physics to a child? Let me think about it a little bit more. And then he came back after, I don't know, a day or two and said, okay, I give up. I, I cannot say I understand quantum physics because I cannot understand it to someone without using like higher abstraction in mathematical terms. So I cannot claim that I understand it because I cannot explain it in a simple terms without mathematics, equations and stuff. Um, so that is also a valid lesson when it comes to like approach when it, touch, when it comes to teaching. That if we like starting up with abstractions Nobody starts with abstractions. People in general don't think abstractions. After a while, when they have like something to do with the process and they start to like seeing some patterns, there after a while they might start noticing some like you know common things, common denominator, the denominators. But you cannot like say, okay, um, you want to calculate how those cars move? Use energy. But what what is energy? Yeah. You have to arrive at the, the abstract. You cannot like start with it. Uh, there was also another thing that many mathematicians was criticizing. It was called like new math. At some point in US, they introduced this new program. I think in Poland we have similar issue that well, children was were stopped being taught how to like use addition, multiplication, division, and stuff. And instead of there was okay, children. You are like 12, you are old enough to learn about what is set, what is group, what are algebras, you can like do some stuff because it's important that you understand all those abstract principles and after a while, okay, we have children that are what are like, no, mathematical abstractions, they don't really understand why they should learn them. On the other hand, those children cannot really calculate like, you know, percentages, so you give them credit and cannot like calculate if it's okay for them to sign up the lease or not. So yeah, 
but they at least heard in school about abstractions. So, so many, many mathematicians were like against this because what's the point? Those children don't really understand why they should use this abstraction. And when it comes to like specific things, they can do things that they would use in their life. So yeah, not really good. Um, other scientist named Tom Lehrer, he was um, not only mathematicians and physicists, but also a songwriter. He was like doing like, like those really interesting songs and parties, so I can recommend his song about new math when he likes, makes fun of this approach. Um, so yeah, from like high level overviews, so what Feynman would tell, tell us about like teaching things, it would be like, oh, that was also one of the things he said that you shouldn't explain things using the very things that you want to explain. And energy is a great example of that. So if you want to explain er, uh, what, what, how process works and you use the word energy, then basically you're saying, okay, children, if you want to understand energy, you will have to use energy. So um, same with a lot of like a lot of ma another mathematical concepts. If we like starting out with all those old wise sounding definitions, then probably we will we are not uh, what well, not aware of it, but we are trying to explain things using the very things we are trying to explain. So um, people will understand. Will already understand. People that don't understand, they well don't get anything out of it. So kind of misses the purpose. And also that the abstraction is something derived from the specifics, so not the other way around. So if you want to someone to show, okay, we can do something this way, then this way, then this way. Do you see some common pattern? Let's try a few more things. This, this, this. Okay, I can see a pattern here. Let's try like to extract it and name it and maybe um, describe it in some formal way. But if we're doing like, okay, so the children, then let's try use algebra, and then if you apply to this algebra, this, you will receive this, and this, then you will receive this. And children are like, aha. Uh -huh. I wouldn't say that's the best uh, way to teaching people stuff. Um, also, when it comes to explaining people things, there was another story about Feynman. It's about actually a part of one of his interviews. Uh, basically, one of the interviewers who wanted to understand how Feynman explains things, ask him, uh, can you explain me how magnets work? What is magnetism and stuff? So Feynman starts asking questions. Okay, so what do you want me to explain to you? Well, how magnets work? No, what do you want me to explain to you? And, you know, interviewer gets a little bit nervous. He feels like, okay, he, does Feynman like avoiding the question? He's saying, okay, let me tell me this way. Um, if we have a like, normal, normal person, if, you, if I wanted to explain to him what magnetism is, but this normal person doesn't have any sense of scientific background, any sort of like, uh, knowledge about some element of physics, like all, everything I can say that you know, there is like magnets, they have like positive side, negative side, and they like repelling. And you know, I cannot tell them anything more because I'm not given any sort of tools, anything to compare to, anything they can relate to in their head when, if they want to understand things. Basically, explanation has to be set up in some sort of framework around the knowledge that the people you are explaining things to already have. If I have uh, science students of second on or third year that already knows about electrons and how they interact, so we can say that the electrons are spinning, and if they are spinning in the same way, those forces like adapt and then when we, we, we have the magnetism and things like that, and you can see that they are repelling, but this is not the complete explanation, because if you want to go even deeper, then we'll have like, you know, quantum mechanics, but with quantum mechanics, then when it comes to like, even most majority of the people, you don't have anything to compare to, so it's even more difficult to explain, because if I wanted to explain to you, I would like to compare it to something that you understand, so that you can, would have something you can relate to. But with quantum mechanics, there's no such things. Happily for us, with uh, functional programming, we don't have anything like quantum physics, so we can always relate to something. Problem is that we not always do it. Quite often we do it, whatever the 
majority of mathematicians do. So, okay, kids, you have these abstractions, just use them. You will be fine. Um, yeah. Um, on some other interview, if I must say something like, people always ask me how it comes that I seems to understand all those concepts so well and how I can like explain stuff. And I'm thinking, okay, when we are telling me all those mathematical definitions, well, I not really that smart to parse all of that in my head. So what I'm doing, okay, I'm taking those principles and try to find in my head something I already understand, which sounds intuitive to me, and compare it, like, you know, like atoms or balls that are like clashing together and, and bouncing off, meaning basically something like from real life that I can already relate, understand, it's intuitive to me. So once I find this kind of model, usually I can reason pretty accurately how things should like behave. Um, and then I can start asking questions, okay, but if you do this and this, then this should happen. Wow, how did you came, came up with what? Is, how do you understand that? Well, basically once I make up this mental model where I re like, um, refer to something that I already understand, then it's simple. And this is also something that we are very often missing when it comes to those explanations and when it comes to FP mathematics in general. You're opening a blog post and you have something like, okay, so the definition of this data structure is this, this, this. Uh, there are some rules about it, contracts, this, this, this. Uh, go home, you know everything. So, yeah. If things work this way, then if we wanted to, for people to understand programming language, we will give them the specification. Okay, guys, this is the specification for Scala, leaves C++. Once you read it, you are ready to program everything. And yeah, you're master programmers. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Also, when, so basically, when we want to explain something about FP, then we also have to re remember that not everyone has CS background. So, for some certain people, something like algebra, it's not something they are familiar with. Um, there are also like people who became programmers, but they came from I don't know electronics, so they might be very good at uh, integrals, calculus, and stuff, but they might have like you know very large gaps when it comes to graph theory, discrete mathematics and stuff. They are specialists on their own term, but they might not know the math that you are taking for granted. So you always have to like uh, consider that when it comes to your explanation. Some people have no mathematical background at all. So when we have like, um, let's say, fronted, a lot of front-end guys are, are people that don't have to no mathematics because, in large part, when they came to front end, nothing was was really needed. So if we like introducing some mathematical concepts concepts to them, there was nothing that like you know, encouraged them before to learn those stuff. So if you are like coming to them and try to explain things to them, then probably you have to be prepared that no one be pretty smart guy, but you need, may need to explain some things to them and not not in a way that would like you know make them feel like worse for not knowing this stuff because they're still pretty good specialists and stuff. Um, and also if you want to teach someone a formal definition, it's like good to make sure that they are know the foundations because other, otherwise we will have like th this sort of teaching that we have in certain schools like memorizing the definitions, then you have the exam when you are remembering the definitions, but it never really works. One of the lessons I take from my professors was like, the most important things about the basically computer science students is not memorizing a lot of definitions. It's building up intuitions, how, how things works. And then when you have those intuitions, then you can forget the definition, but you'll still more or less know how to use it. And basing on your intuition, you can like, uh, recover the missing knowledge about the definitions, how things should work together, because you have those like instincts, what it should do. That should be our like first and most important thing when you want to teach someone something that they we have to build their intuition about stuff. Once they have intuition, we can formalize it. But we start to formalize it and then give the intuition. Uh, I doubt it. Um, so let's do some like short example when we could like try to apply some principles from like 
things that we get from Freeman. So a classical example would be like Mona tutorial. So there are some like typical approaches to Mona tutorials that we don't want people to use. Like first one is uh, monoid in the category of endofunctors. <laughs> yeah, basically everyone hears about it. It originates as a like, sorry? Ah, yeah, because you know, it originated as a basically observation, then it turned into a joke, but considering that there are like, a lot of tutors, a lot of courses, someone will eventually start to think about that this is enough that people need to do when it comes to understanding moments. Just let what, learn what the monolith is, learn what the endofunctor is, you understand monads, go for it. Uh, yeah, sure. There are also like comparisons, like this, the monad is like taco or burrito or whatever. And worth knowing that the post that was referring to monad is like burrito was actually a sarcasm when the author like claimed that if you are coming up with like all those weird comparisons that worked for you, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will work out for other people quite well. So if you're not sure how to explain stuff to people, then maybe you shouldn't explain them to people because it will only confuse them. Basically, the post was against writing a thousand and one mono tutorial. So because if the authors don't get them well, they don't explain them well. It will cause only a lot more confusion. Um, also, another freak I saw, it was like, okay, what is a monad? So basically, monad is a type class. <laughs> this type class some, has some laws, and if you follow them, you will be, will be okay, so yeah. That is also like, not a good approach, because you know, it binds the explanation to some implementation. Um, it requires people to understand what is a type class, even though they don't really have to understand it to, to get what the monad is, and so on. But instead, we can like start telling a story. We have some friend. He wants to do stuff. He wants to understand like what uh, this I/O monad is about. So let's just skip all the part when we are selling him the concept and making sure that he understands the like functions and values. If he don't get that, we need to explain it to him before. So okay. So let's say we have this side effects: reading, writing, curl. We know they have side effects. We want to get rid of them. Uh, again, we need to get a proper explanation to our friend why, should we, why we want to get rid of those side effects because, yeah, if we skip this last part, he might then understand why we are going into all this effort from now on. So we have side effects. We want to get rid of them. How we could get rid of them? Well, we could basically, instead of using side effects, using so algebra that will um, basically replace our side effects. Instead of like writing or reading, we will just use some like ATT, which describes the very same thing. Okay, so instead of writing and reading, we will just return this uh, ATT and things are okay, nice. But what if we want to compose? Well, we want to compose, we would have to, we, we can f came up with something, let's call it IO because it will have side effects of us. We will make sure that um, it will be able to map because the map will allow us to like, okay, we are counting side effects and after the side effects we are doing something. Uh, and this way we can have like simple chaining of operations, <laughs> doing side effects and then doing stuff. So how we could imp implement it? Well, basically we could like um, create implementation of this IO, let's call it suspend. Uh, the suspend will like um, encapsulate, em embed our type of effect, okay, that's one, one use case, but how we would do map, when we could like implement another example of this I.O., let's call it map, it would take like, the previous result, the function that would defer something from it, and this way we would, would create this new value that would represent the mapping. So far, we are always returning like pure values, things are pretty good. At some point, someone would have to like, you know, use pattern matching, <laughs> take this stuff and turn all those things into actual computations, but we here don't have to do this, we are pure. This part of our curl base shouldn't like bother how this would be implemented and we are happy about it. Um, does it work? Yeah, except the one, one example, what if we want to like use two, two effects at once then? 
we are getting IO of IO. So what is side effect of side effects? Well, basically, it doesn't make much sense. So we would like to avoid something like that because yeah, how, to, how to even understand it? No, nobody, nobody can really understand it in like a reasonable way. So we we'll have to make some ways that we are taking one side effects, another side effects, and we are still getting I.O. instead of like some weird things. Um, so maybe I came up with some flatten that would like fl flatten this I.O. out of I.O. into one I.O. OK. But we actually don't have to use this flatten if this map operation already did this for us. So let's call it flat map for distinction. If we have something like that, then we could like squash side effects without much issue. So, okay, um, let's implement this flat map. For now, let's remove map because we see map is not powerful enough. We have to get rid of it. For now, implement flat map. We can see that we can implement it like this. Creating this case called flat map, it will take this IO with the previous computation as before, but right now we have this function that takes A and returns AO of B. Okay. So that should handle the, the IO stuff. As you can see, we can like read line, write line, compose things, everything works. So we are almost fine with the one exception. What if we wanted to return like a pure value? Like I want here to return two or three or string. Okay, so we don't have the ability for that, so we need to add it. Because we want to return pure value, let's just introduce the third part of our ADT, pure, and we have IO. Okay, so. Right now, we are able to create some side effects, compose them, return pure values, flood map, all of the things. So yeah, it's quite nice. As a bonus, we also can implement map using flat map, so um, we can all re recover our previous functionality. So yeah, yeah, we implemented basically IO monad. And if we like, we'll show people that it like that, that okay, there are some like logical steps while you are doing this and that, and people, it will be easy to understand it for them. Uh, even though nowhere in this like whole process we use words like, uh, right now we are implementing IO monad. It will be, you know, laughable. It will be referentially transparent. Um, inside is basically a free monad with the free algebra hard coded to side effects. We don't have to use any of this stuff. We only want to say, okay, so we want to achieve this and this and that and show how Coming out from those like requirements, we re like reaching the conclusion. So, yeah. Uh, so that was the example. Are there any questions? I thought so. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.